Church. Glad to have you this evening. And a little bit of our modified service here, obviously, due to uh, what's going on with this uh, COVID-19. And, but we're glad you decided to join us this evening. We'll be having the special treat of Brother Chuck Hessler preaching for us tonight. Looking forward to that. Let's open our service in a word of prayer, shall we? Our Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. I pray that you would bless this service, Lord. I pray that you would be honor, glor- honored and glorified in all that's said and done. We are certainly thankful for all that you're doing and how you're working in our lives. Lord, I pray that you put a special touch of protection upon our families, Lord, and those that are, are affected by this COVID-19. I pray that you would allow us to still be faithful uh, to your calling, Lord. I pray, Father, that we would... Uh, just submit ourselves to you, Lord. We love you, and we thank you so much for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a couple songs uh, this afternoon, or this evening, I should say, and uh, we're going to start with Higher Ground. Higher Ground, it's a good song. It says, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. So let's sing Higher Ground. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining. Every day, still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My feet have no desire to stay where doubts arise. And fears dismay, though some may dwell where these abound. My prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's and me are hurled for faith of God, the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, my faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch the glee. Of glory bright, but still I'll pray, pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Amen. Beautiful singing. I know you're singing at home, right? Amen. Good song tonight. Uh, We'll sing another song. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness. What a peace is mine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. 
and beautiful singing. We're going to have Brother Adam come and let us know what's going on in the life and ministry of our church. We have several things going on, several updates we need to uh, consider as we move forward for the Lord and, and as we keep things going here. And we'll, at this time, have him come and give us some announcements. Well, good evening. Good to see you guys again. Even though I, I can't really see you, but I know you're there. Um, whether you're on Facebook Live or you're listening on YouTube, joining in, I'm excited that you guys are here uh, for our service. I know things are a little bit different, um, so to just give you guys an update and just kind of fill you in on what's going on, which, by the way, be checking the website daily because anything could change at any moment um, with anything here. So all the updates and everything you need to know will be on the website. Um, so make sure you're checking that daily. Um, all the time being interactive on that. And um, on the website, some of the things that um, just there's some concerns that you guys should know um, just about how to, how to worship, how to help, and how to um, just how to serve. Um, that's all going to be on the website. And we know tithing, um, we're getting that on the website. Um, we're using the app Tithely, which is tithe.ly. Um, by the end of today, you'll be able to click the link on there, and it'll take you directly to it. And we'll have a tutorial on YouTube and some directions on the website on how you can tithe uh, through this time. Uh, you can always, you're welcome to just come drop your tithe off at the church, but if you just want to do it um, through electronically, that you can just do it that way. Um, you can, if you're watching this, then you know how to watch our services, but um, you can share the word, um, tell people that we're going to be on Facebook Live and we're going to be on YouTube, um, and that's how you can kind of join in on the worship services. Um, you can be a part of that. Um, food pantry, last week we had, um, which there will be no food pantry the 28th, so that's next week, next Saturday, there'll be no food pantry, um, but yesterday, food pantry, we had 72 boxes that we made, um, we were able to serve 235 people um, with eight new families, it was a little bit different, um, as I said this morning, we had that little, kind of the drive through way that we did it, but it worked very well, um, and it's just, it's always great to be able to serve the Lord and know that we're making an impact and helping the people trying to further the gospel and to show God's power. Um, just to kind of reiterate everything, remember to be checking the website daily, and that will tell you guys everything you need to know, um, just about Facebook Live and YouTube and how all that's going. Um, make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, make sure to just like and subscribe and click the little notification bell so you get the notifications. Um, when we post a new video or update our status, it will just shoot you a direct message so you'll know um, when anything changes. And um, for, new uh, for the tithing ways, um, they just added Venmo, there's PayPal, uh, there's the Tithely app, and again, you can just drop it off. Um, so that's the updates we have for today, and I uh, hope you guys get something out of the message and just enjoy the service. Let's, say, let's sing one more song together before the preaching of God's word entitled, Until Then. My heart can sing when I pause to remember a heartache here is but a stepping stone along the trail that's winding always upward. This troubled world is not my final But until then, my heart will go on singing. Until then, with joy I'll carry on. Until the day, my eyes behold the Savior. Until the day, God calls me home. The things of earth will dim and lose their value if we recall their borrowed.
until the day God calls me home. Until the day my eyes behold the Savior. Until the day God calls me home. Amen. Beautiful singing tonight. Pray for Miss Olivia as she sings a song right before Brother Chuck brings the message. At this time, we're going to have Brother Chuck Hessler come and bring forth the Word of God. Thankful for his faithfulness, thankful for uh, his willingness to preach today. And uh, he was scheduled to preach already, and we wanted to keep things as normal as possible. So at this time, he's going to come and bring forth the Word of God. Please pray for him as he preaches for us this evening. Thanks, Brother. Hello. Thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to be uh, talking about, the title is Freedom from Bondage, and uh, we're going to be talking about how uh, the Lord brought 
the children of Israel out of Egypt and their bondage. And he was taking them to a place where they would know him personally as their God, as their Lord, and um, setting up a place to worship uh, the tabernacle and setting up a, a, a place that was specifically set aside for worshiping and coming before the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us, Lord. I thank you for the free gift of salvation. And I pray, Lord, that uh, today as we talk about just bondage and, and uh, this temporal life, Lord, how we can have victory over those things when we allow you to bring us to the place that you want us to be, Lord. So I pray that you'd bless this message and uh, that ultimately, Lord, we'd be able to bring you glory. We ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so we're going to start in Exodus 3. Exodus 3. And again, um, we're, we're talking about the, um, through our faith journey, that the Lord is always trying to draw us to himself and giving us opportunities to do so. But it's a matter of if we allow ourselves or our flesh to fight that, or submit to what he's trying to do in our lives. So we're going to start in Exodus 3. We're going to look at verses 13 through 15. And Moses said unto the Lord, I'm sorry, excuse me. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me. And God said moreover unto Moses, thou, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. So the first thing we see here is that the children of Israel did not know the Lord personally. He is described as the Lord God of your fathers. So they personally did not know him. So if we're going to come to a place, uh, first we have to know who the Lord is before we can uh, be drawn to him and understand uh, who this God is. So the children of Israel knew of God but they didn't know him personally. He was not their God. He was the God of their fathers, as it says. Uh, they didn't even know his name. If we look at uh, chapter 3, 13, the tail end of that, and it says, And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And this is uh, Moses speaking with the Lord here. And um, they knew of this God, but they they haven't been to a place where they fully understood who God was in his character. So uh, that's where we're at here. Um, if we're going to worship the Lord properly, we must know his name. We must know who he is, his character, and how to worship him. The Lord is always sending messengers so that people may know him by name. He is a personal God. So that's what we want to know about our God is he's a personal God. So God is always drawing us to a place to know him, a place to be alone with him, a place to commune with him. He's trying to bring us out of the everyday situations and bring us to a place that we know him. Um, he's taking us out of our places of comfort and contentment, and uh, he changes our circumstances. Right now, our nation is going through a time where we are not in a place of uh, comfort or a place of uh, unusual circumstances right now is where we're at, and uh, the Lord can do some great things. People have asked me, uh, do I think uh, the Lord is sending judgment on our nation? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I don't know that, but what I know is that through these situations, we have an opportunity to draw closer to him, and if we allow that, then we can see him work in our lives. So we need to take our focus off of us and the things that we are in control of so we can see clearly looking to him and crying out to the Lord. So let's go to Exodus 14. Let me go to Exodus 14. And 
and we're going to look here. Uh, let's look at, uh, we'll start at 5 here, Exodus 14, 5. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from serving us. And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh of Egypt, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them and camping by the sea beside Pihiroth before Baal Zephon. So what we have here is that the, uh, the children of Israel have left Egypt and they're going out into the wilderness. Pharaoh said they may go. And he's bringing them to this place. Uh, the Lord is bringing them to a place where they have nowhere to go and all they can do is rely on the Lord. So he took them out of their place of comfort. Their, their circumstances changed greatly. Now they have uh, Pharaoh, these 600 chariots. They're chasing these people. And now they're up against the dead end of the Red Sea. And let's see what it says here in verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. So they're coming to this place, but when the Lord is going to do something, and we know this Lord, so they were starting to know this Lord, this, this God, um, the I Am, but it was the God of the, their fathers, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And... So they're being brought to this place, but in order for the Lord to do something, and in order many times for the Lord to do a work, we have to submit to him. So many times he takes us out of these places of comfort, and he brings them to this place just like this, where it seems that there's no other way to go. And so they're up against this Red Sea, and they're coming. But look what happens in verse uh, 10 here, in 14.10 it says, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. So through this situation... The children of Israel looked up to the Lord, right? That they, they were now lifting up their eyes to the Lord, and they were sore afraid. And look what it says. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Many times the Lord has to bring us to places that we will cry out to him. He's always trying to draw us to himself. He wants us to have communion with him. But so often when we are in the norm and we're complacent and uh, there's no reason in our life to draw towards the Lord, uh, we don't. And, and many times when life is good, we aren't compelled to be drawn to the Lord, but it's when we're at our low point or when he brings us to a place of breaking or uncertainty that we come before the Lord. So we see here in 11 it says, And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, thou hast taken us away to die in the wilderness, wherefore thou hast dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt. So fear has come over them, and they are asking uh, Moses, "Did the Lord just bring us out here to die?" Right. So they're they're looking at their situation, they're crying out to the Lord, but they're so focused on what's going on that they're they're scared. They're not really uh, yet at a place where they understand what the Lord's going to do. So fear causes one of two things to happen: it either draws people closer in submission. Or it drives or causes a person to run from it. And that's usually what people do with fear is one of those two things. Uh, people will either draw closer to God or run away from him. That's exactly what we have in these situations. Uh, just again, uh, this wasn't the point of the message, but with what we're going through right now as a nation, people are scared. People are, are just panicking. They're, they're going crazy. They're trusting in their riches, in their money. Uh, they're trusting in toilet paper forts. As, uh, as it's been called, that, uh, and, they're, and they're putting all this trust into things instead of the Lord, but the Lord is allowing this to be an opportunity for us to draw near to him, 
Somebody through this, uh, hopefully many people through this, will draw to the Lord because of the fear of what's going on right now in their lives. So uh, anyway, as I said, it either drives us uh, closer to something or it causes submission or we run from it. Um, and what we need to realize is with the Lord is all of us one day, we can run from the Lord. We can run from him uh, our whole lives. But one day we're going to stand before him and all one day will stand before him. Uh, the Lord in peace or in fear. Let's look at Philippians 2. Philippians 2, we're going to go to verses 9 and 10. Philippians 2, 9 and 10, I'm sorry, 9 through 11 we'll go. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth, and the things under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So at some point, we are going to have to give an account, and we're going to have to stand before the Lord. So through these opportunities, through fear, through these things, the Lord is bringing these people out of bondage, drawing them to himself, and giving them a chance to know him. In our own lives, there are times of uncertainty, but God always allows these things so that we can turn to him. As people, we don't know peace or we wouldn't know what peace is unless we can compare it against turmoil. And uh, in order to know true peace, it's from the Lord that gives us the, the true peace and all peace that passes our understanding, all understanding. Again, the Lord is taking us out of our circumstances, our comfort zones, to bring us to a place to worship him. That's what he's trying to do with the children of Israel. This wasn't written to us, but it was written for us as an example of the Lord trying to show us that the way that he draws us to him, he's bringing us to a place separate of our normal circumstances to come and worship him. Let's look at uh, Exodus 20. We'll go back to Exodus here. Let's go to Exodus 20. going to look at verses 18 through 20. Here God is showing himself, his power, his glory, his moving presence before them. But the people were caught up in the circumstance and the, missed the blessing of God revealing himself. It says here in uh, verse 18, and all the people saw the thundering and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, to test you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. So, again, what we have here is the people liked God from a distance. They didn't like the personal aspect, they saw this guy was trying to give them a, a, um, a blessing of seeing him work in their lives. He was, he was there, the presence, the power, all these things were right in front of him. But the people were afraid and they removed themselves from it. Verse 19, it says, they told Moses, you speak to us, let not God speak to us. Moses sought to encourage the people not to be afraid. That's what he was trying to tell them here. It says in 19, and they said unto Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. So fear not. He explained, for God has come in order um, that the fear of him may remain with you, that you may not sin. It's what it says here in verse 20. And Moses said unto the people, fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your eyes, that you sin not. That's why the Lord is revealing himself. Again, sin separates us from the holy presence of the Lord. So in this situation, the Lord works in situations to draw us to him. By his power and glory, he is in full control. He wants us to know that about him. But how do we approach these times when he shows himself? Do we trust in ourselves and our situations? Or do we come by faith and faith alone through these things? As the children of Israel are taken out of bondage of Egypt, 
They are told not to do as the world around them does. They are told to be set apart. That's what we're to do as believers. We're not to be doing the things of the world that they are doing. And as God's people, we are not to be caught up in these things that are going on around us. We are called out of bondage from that place. Again, the Lord is pulling them out of this situation. He's saying not to do uh, these things around them that were so common to them uh, in their situation in Egypt. Let's go to Exodus 23. 24, Exodus 23, 24. And it says, Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them and quite break down their images. So the Lord is telling them not to bow down to whose gods? Their gods, right? So the Lord's saying, don't do as they do. Um, the world's gods, the sinful pleasures of this life is, is the things that, um, that w- could so easily beset us in our lives if we, if we don't give God proper place. We are not to serve them or give in to their desires. See what it says here? It says, thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them and quite break down their images. That that quite is to take the uttermost or the absolute extent to completely break down their images, right? Um, but we're told in verse 25 that we are to serve the Lord, your or our God. Let's look at 25 here. It says, and you shall serve the Lord, your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. So... The Lord needs to be our God. He's, he can't be the God of our fathers. And this is so important. What the Lord is trying to do is bring all of us to a place where he is our God. He wants that fellowship with us. He wants to take us out of bondage. He's trying to draw us to himself, but we have to allow that. But in order to do that, we have to separate ourselves from the things of this life and not be caught up in serving the flesh and our desires or their desires in sin. So in Exodus 23, 32 through 33, it says, They will make you sin against me and serve their gods. I will surely be a, um, it will surely be a snare to you. So let's look at Exodus 23, 32. It says, Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. Right? And so in our world, what are, what are the covenant that, that people uh, make or that... Um, I'm sorry, what are the gods that, that people make in this life? So it could be money, it could be safety. In our, in our country, we're blessed. And because we're blessed, so often we have strayed so far away from the Lord and we've given him this, um, this place of lowness in his, in his place in our lives because we can buy things, we can provide for ourselves, we can do what we need to do, and um, we don't lean on the Lord because so often in our country... We don't have to lean on the Lord. And uh, the blessings that are given to us also can be the same that are the curses against us because we can trust in those things and those riches. So he says um, that thou shalt make no covenant with them nor with their gods. And 33, they shall not dwell in thy land lest they make thee sin against me. If thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto you. In this life, there are many things that are drawing us away from the Lord. And uh, the, the state of our country with the church and where we've come, we've um, allowed the world to come into the church. The world should always, there should be people from the world always in the church because it's a lie. We should be drawing people out of the world and bringing them into the church, but we shouldn't allow that culture to be the overflow of our church where our church has now became, become the same place as the world. And so, so often that's what's happening. God is calling us out of this present corrupt world to be separate, not entangled with the affairs of this life. And, and you guys know this one, but let's look at uh, 2 Timothy 2.4. 2 Timothy 2.4. I'm talking about being entangled with the affairs of this life. 2 Timothy 2.4. Um, it says... No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him 
who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So what that's saying is no soldier in active service entangles him with the affairs of things going on. He has a job. He has a post. There's things that he should be focused on, and he shouldn't be caught up with things that are distraction to what he's called to do, the position or the post that he's been, he's been placed in. And um, he has to please the one that he's enlisted to, right? That, that's, that's who he gives his authority to. We are to not be caught up in the things of this life and be distracted from the things that God called us to do. It's so easy for us to just give in to so many things because the rest of the world's doing it. We see so many things that people are, um, are doing that look like they would be pleasurable. And sometimes we, we're drawn to those things and we're tempted by those things, but those things draw us away from the Lord. And the way that we know what we should be doing is by spending time in the Word of God and reading and studying what God's plan is for us and how we're supposed to conduct ourselves. So let's go back to uh, Exodus 14 here. Exodus 14. Getting a lot of, a lot of Bible today. We'll be all over the place here. Exodus 14. Okay, verses 10 through 12 again. Uh, there's a tendency within our sinful flesh, and the desire at times is to go back to the way of life that is not full of God's blessing. Uh, a draw to do as the world does, as I said. So let's look at, again, uh, Exodus 14, 10. And we read these verses, but this time I want you to look at it from a different angle. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. But look what it says. It says, and they said, so this is the people that came out of Egypt, the children of Israel. And they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, thou hast taken us to die in the wilderness. Wherefore thou hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt. It is not. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. So there's this desire as believers when we're scared, when things are going on, there's this part of our flesh that desires to go back to uh, this life. I'm a first generation Christian. I know some of you have heard me say this before, but. Um, so I'm new. I was in the world. I, I know what the world has to offer. I, I was uh, enticed by the things of the world. And sometimes, as believers, we're still drawn to those desires. And that's exactly what the children of Israel are going through here when they said, and they said unto Moses, uh, because there are no graves in Egypt, basically, couldn't we have just stayed in Egypt to die? And hast thou taken us to die in the wilderness? Wherefore thou hast dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? So there was this desire when God is trying to bring us out of this world, the, the temptations, the, the, just all the things that our flesh is so easily enticed by, music and, and movies and just entertainment and all these things that are, are not pleasurable for us. Women, whatever they may be for each one of us, uh, the Lord is is bring us out of that for our own good, but we have this desire within us to think for some reason that we want to go back to this life that we had, but he's trying to draw us out of those things because he's in control. Um, it is not always easy to trust in the Lord, to know that he is in full control, but God is always trying to bring us to a better place. This is exactly what he's doing here. As I keep saying, he's taking them out of this place because he wants them to know him personally. So again, in our lives, he has to take us out of the situations of this world to bring us to a place that we can personally know him where he's in full control. He has called us out of bondage and he offers deliverance from the present dangers and troubles of this temporal life, the deliverances through Christ. So how do we come to this place of deliverance? How do we approach and put forth our faith in Jesus Christ? There's a proper way to approach the Lord and to be in his presence. Let's look at Exodus 19. Exodus 19, and throughout this whole thing, the Lord is taking them to all these places and trying to do a work on the heart. So we're going to look at Exodus 19, we're going to look at 7 through 12, 
It says, And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all the words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So they're, they're, they're going to do what they said they're going to do, right? And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with thee. The Lord wants us to hear him speak. He, he's, he's, again, we can't hear the Lord speak if we are so distracted by the, the chaos and the noises of this world, the, the things that draw us away from him, that the point of this message is just to come to a place where we can commune with God. And through our situations, he's drawing us to that. It says here again in 9, And believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. In verse 10 it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto thy people, sanctify them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of the people unto Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall be surely put to death. So what's going on here? The first thing we want to see in this is that the Lord is trying to sanctify them, right? He's to be set apart. In verse 10, and the Lord said unto Moses, go unto the Lord and sanctify them today and tomorrow. And he says, let them wash their clothes. So if we're going to come before the Lord and we're going to come before the presence of the Lord, we need to sanctify ourselves. We need to do a a spiritual cleansing, a, a purity of the inward and the outward of our body. Sin separates us from the Lord, and um, we, need to, we need to get any sin that hinders our relationship with the Lord as far away from us as possible so we can commune and come before the Lord. So the Lord's saying he wants to speak with them. It says in 9 that the people may hear when I speak with thee. So he's going to speak with Moses, but he wanted the people to hear it. But in order to do that, before we can be in the presence of the Lord, we need to have gotten sin out of our life. Sin separates us from the Lord, and a holy God, sin cannot be before his presence. So um, many people, I often like to say, like the idea of a Savior or a Redeemer. But some people don't like to make Jesus Lord of their life, right? And that means that um, he's, he's master, he's Lord, he's over us in all aspects, that you obey him, and not yourself, and not what you want to do. So again, in order to approach the Lord, we must do it in humility and obedience. So he says again in 10, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto thy people, and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. And it says here in verse 11, And be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of the people unto Mount Sinai. So, um, they, the Lord was giving them the opportunity to prepare themselves to meet the Lord. So they were to purify themselves outwardly. And when we come before the Lord, we need to set aside time to get away from the things of this life. And the Lord, in his uh, grace, gave them three days, right? And be ready against the third day. Uh, for, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. So they had time to confess and sanctify themselves for a sacred purpose, right? That's what, that's what it is, to sanctify, to be used for a sacred purpose. Um, we can't be used by the Lord until we cleanse ourselves and we're pure before, we come, before he comes amongst us. And verse 11 says, I'm sorry, verse 12 says, And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that ye go not up into the mount, nor touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall surely be put to death. The Lord has set up boundaries for us. Uh, the Lord has set it up so they just couldn't come to the Lord flippantly, right? So the Lord, as he's doing this and he's coming down, um, he, he was doing two things here. He didn't want the people to get so laxed and comfortable in the presence of the Lord. So he, had, he gave them things they had to do, but he also didn't want to see him so distant that he couldn't be personal. So there were set boundaries when coming unto the Lord. When we approach the Lord, it's not commonplace. 
We've made it in this society, in this culture, in the United States, commonplace to come before the Lord, and that's not the proper way to worship the Lord. We need to know where is the place that we must meet the Lord. The church is set aside for this purpose, right? It's, it's not like other places. The church is a special place that we know is set aside for the worship of the Lord. When you come to church, and people say, why do you go to church? Why do you do that? Because it's a place in my life that I've set aside for purely the worship of the Lord. When I come to the church, my mindset, I prepare myself Sunday mornings when I wake up and I, I do my routine. It's not like other days in my life, and I, I, I wish it was more like that. But Sunday I have set aside as a special day, and the church is the boundary, the place that I have set to come and worship the Lord. Um, it's not, it is set apart for worship and a place dedicated to the Lord. The physical building is not what makes it special, right? So when we say the church, it's not this physical building. It's what this physical building is that sets the boundaries for what it is, right? So um, it is the fact that it's the place where we come to worship and commune with the Lord. It is solely dedicated to Him, for Him, and His purposes. That's why we need to meet at church. So uh, we need to give the Lord a place He deserves in our lives, a place where we can come to worship Him. And that's, as I said, that's the place that the church is. If you're going to know God, you're going to come to the, the church, you're going to hear God speak, you're going to hear God speak through His Word. That's how He's doing it. So when we come before these things and we're drawn out of the world and we're taken out of the filth and the sin and the bondage of the world, when I come to this place, I've set aside that I'm expecting to hear from God. I want to hear God. I want to hear His Word. When His Word is preached, I know He's speaking to me. And the Lord has set boundaries for them, for the children of Israel. So as He's drawing them out of that. Let's go to Exodus 24. Exodus 24, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. 24, 1 through 11 in Exodus, it says, And He said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron and Nadab, and Abihu, and the seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, and all the judgments. And the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in the basins and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Lord hath said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone and as it were the body of heaven in its clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel laid not his hand. Also they saw God and did eat and did drink. So the, what, what do we see within this context here? In verse 5 it says, And Israel sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed, sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. That sacrifice peace offerings is what we're looking for. The only way to have peace with the Lord is through the covering of our sins. That's the only way that we can have peace with the Lord. Um, this is a sacrificial peace offering, right, through these things. Uh, John one twenty nine tells us, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Romans 5.1 tells us, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So before these people were able to see God, they had to come to a place of peace. They had to come to uh, the sacrifice of peace of what was going on. And 
Um, the Lord is our peace offering. You know, many people are at war with God. Many people um, are afraid of God they, because they know that their, their heart and their soul is not right with God. And the way that we can know we have peace is therefore being justified by peace, as it says in Romans 5.1, that we're, we're justified, we're accepted of the Lord uh, by faith, and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that, that peace offering, before we can do that, so in our lives, when people are not right with the Lord and they, they are um, fighting God, there is no peace in their life because they haven't given him the place he deserves. They haven't submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ. So there's, there's this battle going on within them. And in order to have peace with the Lord, we have to repent, right? He was calling them to come out, to, to cleanse themselves, to purify themselves, given time to do it, coming to a certain place to come and worship them. And the Lord, that's how we have peace with the Lord is through Jesus Christ. Verse 7 says what? It says here that, and he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. Jesus told us in John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Again, so we have this peace. All these things are through Jesus Christ. The completion of all these things, this worship and the seeing of God is through Jesus Christ. So it says here, as it said, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So in seven, and all that the Lord said, we will do. So before you come before the presence of the Lord, you have to be obedient to the things that God has said. It says in verse eight here, the third thing is Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant, which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. So this, this, this blood, this life shed is the covenant that's going on here. So lastly, the blood covenant, um, Jesus is the completion of all three of these things. He's the sacrifice of the peace offering, right? He's being obedient through him. And then he's also the new covenant that we talk about. So Jesus is the completion of all three of these things. He is our peace offering. Man has been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. And we're going to look at verses 18 through 20. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. And all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. So man is reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Right? That's why Christ came was to restore that relationship with man back to the, to the Lord, right? A mutual change, uh, uh, to, to reconcile fully is what that means. It says in 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing or counting their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us a word of reconciliation. So God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Through Christ we have peace with God the Father. Verse 20 says, now when we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray, you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God, right? Uh, we'll, just, we'll just read the last one just because it's great. It says, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no, knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of of God in him. So we are, we are accepted and able to come before the presence of the Lord through Jesus Christ. He, he restored that relationship uh, by coming and dying for us, the covenant of his blood. If we love him, we will keep his commandments. It's by the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of the covenant. Let's look at Matthew 26. Matthew 26. So many of these we read so often, but the weight of them, we don't always know or, or stop and really fully let it roll around. Matthew 26, 26 through 28, and it says, As they were eating, this is the, the Lord's Supper, the, the Passover meal. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is the blood of the New Testament 
which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Again, this is the, the New Testament, the new covenant that we have through Christ and the work of his blood that was shed for us. So what did the blood do? We so often talk about the blood. What did the, what did the blood do for us? Let's look at uh, Colossians 1.20. Colossians 1.20. And Colossians 1.20 says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So again, as by the blood we have peace with the Lord. In the Old Testament, that's what's talking about. These peace offerings, all these things that... Um, that the Lord is showing us as an example through the Old Testament, point towards Christ. That's what the Old Testament does all the way through, is it always points people towards Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, is always pointing and driving people towards Jesus Christ and his person to restore that relationship for uh, the sin that we can't cover on our own, that we can't make right with God on our own, that we need the Lord and his shed blood to do that. Let's look at Romans 5.10. Romans 5.10. Romans 5.10 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, that we shall be saved by his life. Again, is when we were enemies, right? There again, before we have that peace with the Lord and his sacrifice, that the peace that passes all understanding is that we were enemies with God. We, we uh, served our flesh. We were uh, the Lord was waiting for us to come to him, and he's drawing us out of these places, but we need to allow the Lord to do those things. So uh, we were enemies with God, and they were reconciled to God by the death of his son, the blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, much more being reconciled, which shall be saved by his life. Okay, so let's go back to Exodus 24 here. So by all these things they saw God. Likewise, one day we can be with him in glory. Right, so looking back here, it says, I'll just start again, just kind of putting this all together here. So let's start in 24, um, let's start in 24, 5, Exodus 24, 5. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. So we have the peace offering. And Moses took half the blood and put it into basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And the book... <clears throat> and he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. So we have this peace offering. We have the shed blood that's sprinkled on the, on the people. That's representing that the part of it was on the, the altar for God. That covenant was the blood sacrificed on the altar was for God's end of the covenant. And then the blood sprinkled on the people was for their end of keeping the covenant. They're saying they will be obedient. And then it says in verse 8, And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning these words. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the seventy of the elders of Israel. And they saw God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, as it were the body of the heaven and its clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw God, and did not eat and drink. By by doing the, these things, and we can uh, one day come before and be eternally in the presence of the Lord. So, again, just for for recapping, he's drawing us out of these things. He's bringing us to himself. We can have communion with him. We can fellowship with him. So, all these uh, things are written down as examples to us in Scripture, to bring us out of the world and the bondage of this life in before the presence of the Lord. That's what he's trying to do. That was the example of all these things in the Old Testament, taking them out to bring them before him. So let's recap. The first thing is we have to personally know the Lord. If you're going to put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have to know who the Lord is. You have to know what he requires of you, his personality. You have to know him. So the first thing is we have to personally know the Lord. The second thing we have to do is allow him to draw or bring us to the place we need to be. We can't submit to the Lord until he brings us where we need to be. Sometimes that's a place of, of broken um, anguish. Sometimes it's a place where we cry out. Sometimes it could be, as I said, things going on in our nation right now. People are scared. 
and they're going to draw towards the Lord. So he's bringing us where he needs to be. We don't, uh, the third thing is we don't allow God to show his presence and glory if we are focused on our circumstances. They miss the thunderings and the power of God's glory and the blessing of God revealing himself because they were so focused and distracted by their circumstances that they didn't allow themselves to see the Lord at work at that place. We don't want to miss the blessings that only he can provide. The fourth thing is proper fear of the Lord deters a sinful life. We need to have awe and reverence for our creator. The fifth is we are not to get caught up in the things of this life, the bondage of sin and worry. Right? So that's the Lord wants us out of this. This life is temporal. And so often we get caught up in our circumstance, as I said earlier, that they were doing with the things going on and the thunderings and the lightnings, and they were missing what the Lord was doing. So we don't want to get caught up, even right now, as things are going on in our nation. And it's, it's a time of being scared for many people. But I know that the Lord is in full control. Does that mean that something bad might not happen to me or my family? No, something could happen to my family. I could lose a loved one. I, I can't say I'm not. It's, it's not a guarantee. But again, as all these things work for God and his glory, and he's bringing us to this place. So again, we're not to get caught up in the, the bondage and sin and worry. The sixth thing is we have to fight the desire for the pleasures of this life, the things that cause us to sin against God. Right? That's everywhere. It's constantly doing it. Sin separates us from God. If we're in those things, we can't properly give God the place to commune with him. So we need to, we need to get those things out of our lives. And then the seventh is we need to come before the Lord in certain ways. Right. So he's drawing us back to himself. So uh, there's a way to approach the Lord. There's, he's bringing himself to us. And we must, uh, the eighth thing is we must obey him, sanctify ourselves, and know our boundaries, make a place to come and worship him. Again, church is a great place to start for that. Set aside a place that you come and worship. Um, this, this church isn't all about you. It's, it's the Lord. It's his work. It's, it's uh, other believers and being an encouragement to them. But this place should be a place in our life that we've set aside for God to speak to us, to, to come before the presence of the Lord and know that he is working here if we're doing all the things we're supposed to do, if, if we're confessing our sin and we're consecrating ourselves and we're getting right before him, we're listening for him to speak, we're obeying him, and we're setting the boundaries of where we can go for him. He wants to come and he wants to uh, commune with us, and the church is a great place to start. We only have peace with God through Jesus Christ. That's so important. There's no other way to do this, and all of us hear that all the time, and, and we... We uh, understand this, but I don't know if we always fully understand what that means, that, that just the peace that God gives us, we know it. If you're doubting your salvation, you're not sure of something, then you don't have the peace of the Lord. You wouldn't be doubting your salvation if you had peace with the Lord. If you know you're right with the Lord, that you have a, there's a, we're not saved by works, but we do have uh, things that we do in our lives to show evidence of our salvation and we should be repenting. We should be giving things to the Lord and getting right with him uh, in these ways so we can have that peace that only comes through Jesus Christ. And lastly, it is only by the finished work of the cross, the shed blood of Jesus Christ and his atonement, that the reconciliation of God and mankind is through Jesus Christ. So uh, that's just what I have for you today. Uh, just uh, some things to think about where we are, what place do we give God, especially during times like this of uncertainty that uh, instead of being scared, maybe look for the ways that the Lord is trying to work and bring you to where he needs you to be, not where you think you should be. Let's pray.